With future football scheduling up in the air for the Bruins, let's take a look at who UCLA's new Big Ten rival should be. I've got two perfect candidates, so let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, it's your favorite host. It's Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Locked On UCLA. It's free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for making it your first listen each and every day. Of course, as we all know, it's old news at this point, coming closer to nearly the year mark as we've reached the summer, slowly but surely. March Madness now, summer to soon to come and follow eventually. The Bruins and the Trojans will be moving to the Big Ten. In with then 16 teams in the Big Ten, how do you schedule a gigantic conference? Where's UCLA's non-USC football rivals going to come from? With the proposal of the 366 model, you've got three rivals. Well, one of them will be USC for UCLA, as always. And then you've got two permanent football rivals with then an addition of six and six, playing two six schools, one year, six schools, the next year, hosting one, going to the road on the other, and then flip-flopping every four years. So to clarify that, you've got three rivals, two of which you hope aren't involving Maryland and Rutgers for UCLA, who are part of the Eastern Big Ten Division. But let's not stop, let's stop being dumb there. I've got two perfect, ideal solutions for UCLA. Nebraska and Northwestern. Some people might say, you want the two closest schools. Some might say you want iconic brands. This is why Nebraska and Northwestern are the two best options for UCLA when it comes to Big Ten rivals, especially in football. One, Nebraska, out of all the Big Ten schools other than USC, is the closest to UCLA. They're the furthest west out of all of them. Nebraska is just over 1,500 miles away. The Bruins recently played them in the previous decade three times, home and home, and then a bowl game. So you could get that tradition there. The Nebraska fans will travel. I think traveling to Lincoln will be a, would be a fun road trip. And it's the least taxing for UCLA to have them as a rival, in addition to maybe building an extremely entertaining rivalry. Of course, nothing clashes well with blue more than red. So blue and red, why not have two blue and red rivals for UCLA? You've got USC, and then you can add Nebraska. And while, yes, Nebraska was at the bottom of the Big Ten, they have been for almost the last seven to eight years, I think they'll eventually pick it up. And I, I think it just makes sense that Nebraska, at the minimum, since they are the closest school to UCLA in the Big Ten that is not USC, they must be a part of one of the two rivals UCLA may have or will have added in this permanent Big Ten future for UCLA. The Huskers, perfect fit. I, I just think it'd be, it's, it's a must do. It, the fan, it'll be a good rivalry. I think it's a perfect mix between Midwest and then you've got the West Coast. Nebraska fans will travel. They'll make the Rose Bowl matter entertaining. And of course, all the Big Ten fans will travel, but Nebraska fans especially go big red chance already stuck in my brain so i think that will be fun and hey they made it the bruins super welcome after the tragedy of nick pasquale so you always have to remember the the husker fans way back when nearly a decade ago then adding on to that your second rival northwestern so you get nebraska you get that iconic brand tradition although they kind of stumbled back the last couple of years decades plus but Nebraska will always have that name brand for now. Then you get Northwestern, and their brand recognition is the academic side. And with UCLA, Northwestern, those would be the top two teams in terms of schools and academics. Heck, shout out to my uncle who went to both schools, UCLA and Northwestern. Shout out to Uncle Mikey. In the meantime, UCLA, Northwestern, hey, big city, Los Angeles, Chicago. Northwestern's about 13 miles away from O'Hare, 19 miles away from the mid the Midway Airport, Chicago Midway, MW, MDW, so pretty close to a couple of airports for UCLA. Might as well have 
one big city connection there for the Bruins from Los Los Angeles to Chicago. And no, Northwestern is not the closest of the Western schools in the Big Ten. No, they're not even the closest Illinois school in the Big Ten, but I visited Northwestern, their campus, their football facility. It's beautiful in Evanston. I think even though, yes, both Nebraska and Northwestern, ironically enough, were two of the worst teams in the Big Ten in 2022. I'm not trying to make it an easy schedule for UCLA. However, considering you have to play Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State in one year or every other year, you might want some cupcake rivals. But that's not really the point of this right now. I think Northwestern could be a good academic rival. You get the Big Ten saying, hey, Northwestern, UCLA, they rival each other academically. It's not exactly the closest, so it does give UCLA a couple more miles to travel when they have to play on the road to Chicago, but that's the big city connection, L.A. to the Chicago area to go play Northwestern. And while you could go to Champaign and play Illinois, Madison, Minnesota, Iowa, those are much closer, I guess depends what you mean by much closer, but they are closer potential alternate, alternative options for UCLA. I do think Nebraska, as the closest, is the must. You get a big name, both sides, for a variety of sports, get them clashing as rivals, and then you get Northwestern, and you get the academic brand, the big city connections. And while it's not as far out as, say, a Purdue or the Indiana schools, I think Northwestern would be a good connection for the Bruins in terms of just simply, hey, the Purple's pretty sweet to play. Northwestern's been a pretty decent program with their football program the last year plus. Heck, even their basketball program's been growing and growing. I think you can't miss the big city connection. It's not as, not a little bit, just a little bit further than Illinois, the University of Illinois, the Fighting Illini, just over 2,000 miles away. Northwestern is just 2,000 and almost 28 miles away. Of course, it's different flying to airports and busing and chartering and all different things. I just think Northwestern makes perfect sense academically as a rival for UCLA. And again, you can't have too many red teams. Wisconsin, that's too red. Iowa, while proximity would work between Nebraska and Iowa, I just think you want to get two big cities. You get those markets clashing and get their eyeballs on the Bruins. Academics, you get that pumped up. And then you get one brand versus brand with Los Angeles versus Lincoln, Nebraska, UCLA. You get those two together. Those, I think, make the most sense for UCLA. Of course, the Big Ten could help out the Bruins and say, hey, we're going to choose Iowa and Nebraska. Those are your two closest rivals. However, they do need to choose a rival for USC on the other side. So that's why USC could go get an Iowa or Minnesota or Wisconsin to clash with their rivals. So I think a little bit of further travel for Northwestern for UCLA academics right there. And then Nebraska would just be, a, I think, a perfect fit for the Bruins and the Huskers going back and forth. That would be a very fun rivalry with that fan base and how the Bruins would have to up the ante in terms of the Huskers coming to the Rose Bowl in future events and coming to the West Coast in future rivalry clashes. So I think those are two perfect fits. Closest school, closest in academics for UCLA in terms of, hey, two of the better institutions, one sports side, one academic side. That is a perfect fit for either side. So those are my, what might be a, a part of a series in terms of who UCLA's potential football schedules or scheduling rivals could look like from 2024 and beyond. But I just say Nebraska, Northwestern make perfect sense or good fits for one reason or the other, both academically, travel-wise for one, and for the tradition sports wide, sports side on the other. But still, there's still Pac-12 games to be played. One last week of Pac-12 games for UCLA, which means we've got to preview that Arizona State game, considering that could make a big difference. March Madness NCAA tournament seeding on the line for the Bruins as they host the Cats, but first and foremost, the trap game against the Sun Devils at home. I'll tell you who to look out for and why in the second meeting between the two schools. But after I tell you about FanDuel, because you're going to want to maybe want to put some bets on this one. It UCLA could be favored. They might be favored as they have been the majority of these games. But hey, with FanDuel, the number one sports book in America, with March Madness already full in force, with the the conference tournaments and the mid-majors already going on, you're going to want a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 back, especially with the NBA winding up. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. 
The app is super safe, secure, and easy to use. You can go with big payout, big payouts with same game parlays. You can go money line, three pointer strain, how many points you score, all of that with fanduel.com slash locked on. Again, fanduel.com slash locked on gets you a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars back in bonus bets. Say that 10 times fast. Yes, make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA and with us at Locked On. Segment two of Locked On UCLA. We're talking UCLA men's hoops. Already got the rivalry discussion out of the way as to who could be those other two rivals in a 3-6-6 model in future Big Ten with 16 teams scheduling from 2024 and beyond. But now UCLA has sets themselves up for an enormous game against Arizona State. Because I think a lot of the thunder might be taken off of the UCLA-Arizona game if the Bruins lose this game to Arizona State. Heck, you can look on the secondary price market, or the secondary ticket market, I should say, the resale market. The resale market for the UCLA-Arizona State game, $25. For the Arizona game, as expected, well over, well north of $150 bucks in a sold-out expected crowd. Marcus Adams Jr. going to be there in terms of a Big, crucial recruit for UCLA, trying to get him as a late 23 or 24 get for Marcus Adams Jr. Everybody is expecting a fantastic crowd in the Arizona game. And while there should and may be one for the Arizona State game, it's Arizona State who comes in 20-9, and nine, a chance to maybe move up in the Pac-12 standing seedings, get themselves that first round by in the tournament, and most importantly, the Sun Devils are trying to make the NCAA tournament based on the projections. I think the most credible in Joe Lenardi, he has them in slightly coming off a win at Arizona, a place UCLA could not do so earlier this year, where the Sun Devils put up nearly 90 points in come-from-behind fashion against Arizona in Tucson, getting a redefining, season-defining win that might put them in the tournament. The reason why this game is extremely interesting is because Amari Bailey didn't play the first time against the Sun Devils in Tempe when the Bruins won 74-62. And that scoreline shouldn't really deter how important and how tough this game should be because the first time, the Bruins were on the ropes in Tempe. It was back and forth. UCLA didn't seemingly have their footing in Arizona State, but then Tiger shot extremely well, 7 of 11 from the floor, putting up 22 points, hitting his free throws. And while he wasn't the passer and the assister as he normally was, he was able to score those 22. And David Singleton, most importantly, had his last great offensive game. He's only had one double-digit performance, Singleton, since this Arizona State game where he put up 21 on 7 of 10 shooting and 4 of 6 from downtown. Since he's put up 14 points against SC, but he did that on 5 of 15 shooting or something that wasn't as efficient as Singleton has proven as he can be this year. So that was a game where, one, Amari Bailey wasn't playing, was not available. Two, Jaime Hawkins Jr. was not a good scoring threat. He was 4 of 12 in that game, had 9 points, had 5 assists and 6 rebounds, had 3 fouls, a little early foul trouble for Hawkins before getting a couple, a big bucket late down the stretch, which keyed a 27-9 to run against the Sun Devils. They outscored Arizona State by 18 in the last 11 minutes of that second half to put the Sun Devils to bed in front of a packed crowd out at Desert Financial Arena in Tempe. But still, it's Desmond Cambridge Jr. and the Sun Devils who are feeling high and mighty about themselves. Cambridge Jr., 14 points per game, hit the half-court buzzer beater to beat Arizona on the road in a miracle prayer, and they're trying to prove it's not a fluke. Half of Arizona State's wins have come away from home. And the amount of teams that have 10 or more wins away from home, especially amongst power conference teams, is not that high. In terms of wins away from home amongst top 30 teams, Arizona State in their game notes brags, hey, a lot of teams have not done that themselves in the top 30. Only seven teams have more in the top 30 than Arizona State's current situation of 10 or more. UCLA this season in wins away from home, they've got a total of 10 for neutral sites, or excuse me, I got this backwards, pulling up the wrong side. UCLA over on the men's side, they've got a total of, yes, they do have 10. They have 10 wins away from home and four losses away from home. So 
Arizona State has done a lot of their working on the road with Cambridge. They have the two Cambridges, but a lot of the focus will be one on Desmond Cambridge Jr. Don't let him go off from three. And then DJ Horn being especially good from downtown. He's another guy that can go off and shoot the three ball extremely well. He shoots it 33% for the year, averages about 29 minutes. Arizona State has a lot of guys they can throw at you and come off the bench 10 to 15 minutes per game and score the basketball. It's can the Bruins win a game in more of a higher scoring fashion. They did win their first game last week against Utah when giving up 70 or more points this season. First time all season. I think this game against Arizona State, which was heavily, was more defensive leaning the first time, I think this game might be more of an offensive thriller. It may get to the edge of the 70s, or it may be a 60-60 game where the scoring could be extremely efficient. Again, UCLA put up 74 against Arizona State the first time, but it was a slower build in that one. I think this game could be 74-71, 74-69, albeit I think it's in favor of the Bruins, because Arizona State's playing for their season in this game. They win this game, back-to-back wins on the road against top 10 teams. Arizona State is solidified in the tournament. I think they should be in, considering what I saw from them the first time, and while it did take a buzzer beater, they beat Arizona, this is a tough team for UCLA to play against, considering what they just did. Mick Cronin talked about the emotional gas, the emotional energy. Coming from mountain schools, the altitude in Boulder and Salt Lake City, grinding those wins out late, a game you thought you had won against Utah, and a game they had to battle back against Colorado, with Hawkeyes kind of hurting that ankle, and Bono awkward falls here and there. So you wonder what their health and availability is. So one, considering what Hawkeyes did the first time we should ex- I'd love to see how Hawkins readjusts to the Arizona State defense. Two, we'll see how Amari Bailey factors into this game plan, considering he did not play the first time these two teams met up. And three, Bona had one of his worst performances of the season. He had five turnovers, five points, personal fouls, less than 30 minutes played, only four shots. Would love to see him be a physical force down low and be a rim protector against Arizona State in the paint. So, Can he be a guy that sticks on the floor and prepares himself for the Arizona game by a good performance against the Sun Devils by staying in, not biting for the up fakes every time he leaps up and gets a foul called against him? Those are three factors that could or should lead to a UCLA win. One, Hawk is playing much better. Two, how does Bailey factor into this mix with the added adjustments for Arizona State? And then three, can Bona have a big game? I know it was Singleton and Campbell. We'd love Singleton to get back and score 14 points, hit some threes again down the stretch. But I, I'm looking at Triple J, looking to secure that Pac-12 Player of the Year award with a strong week this week. Then you have Bona, who he himself is battling for Freshman of the Year with Bailey. And he'd love Bailey to go back and forth with a big, big game in this one and maybe secure Pac-12 Freshman of the Year awards himself despite missing a month in conference play. Arizona State is ready. Bobby Hurley, they will have he will have his team ready to play. That's why you have to be worried about this game. But I think the Bruins eke it out 74-69. Either way, this evening, the evening of the game, we will react to it immediately following a hopeful Bruin win and keeping the home winning streak alive. That being said, go Bruins until then. Now as we transition on into the last segment of Locked On UCLA, more UCLA-Arizona State talk, but on the women's side. UCLA taking on Arizona State in women's basketball. The Bruins and Corey Close's team really fading down the stretch in some tough losses late in games, losing three in a row from the end of January to the beginning of February against Colorado, Utah, Arizona, all close games. Then they ended the season at Stanford, close loss, home loss to Washington State, and then a home win on senior day to send Charisma Osborne and company to the Pac-12 tournament as a five seed, which is kind of disappointing considering UCLA was as high as the top five, top eight teams in the country, and they faded, and they were this close to beating Stanford a couple of times. They had Utah on the ropes, and it was Utah who ended up winning the Pac-12 this year, and they're a top four team. UCLA had South Carolina on the ropes in their home gym in Columbia. 
That's how close UCLA has been this season to being a truly top-tier contender or a team that struggles with its youth and relies a lot on Charisma Osborne to do everything down the stretch. So the Bruins in their first Pac-12 tournament game in Vegas. Of course, the women, they end the week earlier, so they're already in Vegas for the conference tournament. UCLA, big lead. They had a 14-point halftime lead. They had a 10-point fourth quarter lead coming into the quarter. And for the fourth time this season, UCLA, with their fourth quarter outage, scored less than 10 points in the fourth quarter. Fourth time this season. All too many times UCLA has gone the fourth quarter of a close game and not found a way to do it offensively. Ironically enough, all four of those times they have scored less than 10 in the fourth quarter alone, they actually won all those games. Somehow, someway, against SC, against Cal, against Arizona State. I think they did it previously. But they have 4-0. They have a winning record when scoring less than 10 points in the fourth quarter. Ironically enough. But it's been... Their worst games in the fourth quarter that have defined their season. The stretch against South Carolina. A couple of games against Stanford. Especially that first one. The Arizona ice-cold stretch where they blew that game and let the Wildcats take them to overtime. Well, they did the same thing to the Sun Devils in the first round of the Pac-12 tournament against the worst team in the Pac-12. The worst team in the Pac-12 who for a large portion of this season could not buy a win in the Pac-12 tournament, Pac-12 on the on the women's side. And while they did push UCLA a couple weeks ago in Pauley, the Bruins had to use a late run to eventually win by 19 or more. They had Skinner, who went off for 26 points, hit some threes, helped lead the Sun Devils back, and Simmons get them back with 17. But again, let's take a look at these UCLA fourth quarter numbers. Two for 16 from the floor, only two attempted free throws, Shot 12% from the fourth, floor from the fourth and did not hit a single three. Something happened when they broke for a few seconds and then went into overtime because then Arizona State could not buy a bucket in overtime and UCLA escaped with an 81-70 to 70 win over the Sun Devils, finding a way to win it with four players in double figures. London Jones with her 12 points and 30 minutes off the bench. You had Bessoir, who led the Bruins with 17. Osborne had 16 points, 5 rebounds. Even Kiki Rice had a key 14 points. So UCLA is still learning how to win in the clutch. And it was nice to see Bessoir, who had 5 threes in 8 attempts. If she shoots as efficiently as she does against Arizona State 17-9, the Bruins will be a tough out in this Pac-12 tournament and be a tough out moving forward in the NCAA tournament. And by the time this podcast is released... UCLA will have completed their Arizona game in the women's side in the Pac-12 tournament. But right now, recapping the Sun Devils game, which is scary to think they could not beat one of the lower tier, the bottom tier team in the Pac-12. They could not beat them. But still, if UCLA can find a way to shore up those fourth quarter struggles and get big buckets down the stretch and not rely so much on an Osborne or be so quiet in games where she can't score for two to three possessions in the fourth quarter, then they can make a Final Four run and be one of those dark horse teams now, considering they've fallen from top 10 to middle of the twenty top 25 to now on the edge and maybe getting a very tough draw in the NCAA tournament, potentially South Carolina in a Sweet 16 at their place, which would just, or closer to them in the Sweet 16. Still, UCLA eked it out in the Pac-12 tournament. They move forward. They get Arizona and a chance to move to the Pac-12 semis, which we'll recap on the next episode, the next full episode of Locked On UCLA. Again, the Bruins, they eked it out. They did what they needed to do, but they can be sloppy at times. Late game management is what the women have to focus on. And they got their scores. They got points. And you got to love the focus, how Arizona State went one of seven in overtime and could not buy a bucket, and the Bruins outscored them by 11. Still, it is concerning against better teams that the Bruins have failed to do this on a consistent stretch. That's the thing of playing with a young team. You got one senior, but they don't have the two superstar seniors. They need multiple freshmen to step up and mature in on-court awareness during the next week or so and maybe get that March Madness magic coming into the next 
week or so with the tournament and Selection Sunday just around the corner for all of us. Either way, they're still live in the conference tournament, and the NCAA tournament is just around the corner. March Madness is here, and we are excited. So let's get ready for Vernon 8th lap. Go check out Locked On College Basketball. Make them your second listen. Great college basketball content. We'll talk more UCLA football, basketball, even a little bit of softball coming up in baseball, all here on Locked On UCLA. I'm Zach anderson Yoxheimer telling you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that red subscribe button. Thanks for your support. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You, C, L, A, U, C, L, A, fight, fight, fights. You can also go check out Locked On Pac-12. I jumped on the show with Spencer, talked about UCLA basketball's championship hopes. Make that your second listen. I'm Zach Anderson-Yoxheimer saying so long. Go Bruins. We'll talk to you tomorrow.